Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out the radio version of the show every Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern on WDJY 99.1 in Atlanta. We also air on a podcasting network in Los Angeles called the 405 Media. There's a TV version of the show that airs on KMVT 15 in Silicon Valley at 8 p.m. Pacific on Tuesday nights. Both versions of the show air in other states. For these show times plus past episodes, please visit the show's website at buildingthefutureshow.com. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com. Join me at the 10th Annual Media Excellence Awards on January 18th in Beverly Hills, California. The attendees and I will be celebrating innovation and leadership in technology and entertainment. There are 20 award categories with 1,000 nominees. These awards honor those who are creating groundbreaking technology to better our lives and celebrate the hard work, determination, and brilliance in the leadership within the companies which create the new world we live in today. I will be recording nominees and winners at the awards. For tickets and more information, go to MediaXAwards.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have John Ruby. He's the CEO at Ruby Entertainment and a board member of the Media Excellence Awards. John, welcome to the show. Hi, Kevin. How are you? I'm very well. Yourself? Awesome. It's uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, really excited about uh, all the things that you're doing uh, with your podcasts and hybrid ventures. And, and uh, it's a real... Uh, uh, privilege and a pleasure to uh, be with you this morning. Well, I appreciate it, man. Yeah, and I, I think what you're, you've had a really amazing career as well. But maybe before we kind of dive into your career, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. I grew up uh, on the south side of Chicago. Okay, and so how did you walk me through kind of a bit of your childhood? Like you, you got, you went and took a bachelor of science. What got you kind of passionate about going that direction? Um, you know, in kind of science, accounting and economics early on in, in university. Well, um, I guess I, I'd always, uh, been interested in, and loved entertainment. Okay. I ran the activities program, uh, in high school, and I used to uh, organize all the dances, and uh, um, we were a school uh, in, in the in the center of the city, um, hundred year old school, uh, Very cool. named Saint Ignatius. Yeah, and we used to bus uh, young ladies in from uh, girl schools, uh, you know, all over the city. Okay. Um, so you know, we'd get uh, name bands and stuff. Then I went when I went to college. It, Regis University in Denver, um, I uh, ran the activities program there as well, and uh, but I never really, you know, looked at entertainment as a career. To me, it was a hobby, something I really enjoyed uh, doing, and, you know, I, uh, I got my accounting and economics degree because uh, I felt that, um, that, that that was going to be the, you know, the best thing for me to have a job, and and at the end of the day, I wanted uh, um, accountants uh, and, and business types to report to me, <laughs> and I figured <laughs> sure. the best way to do that was, was to, you know, get a good handle on, uh, on, on how they thought. And so I, I literally looked at, uh, at accounting in particular as uh, learning another language, Sure. and then I got a... Uh, I went to Pricewaterhouse and um, got my uh, got my CPA there. Nice. And then, um, yeah. And but you know, I, I missed uh, action, and I missed the accountability of you know. I, I didn't want to be a scorekeeper. I wanted to, uh, you know, be out there uh, um, and uh, on the line for uh, the bottom line, if you will. And be accountable for results, and so, uh, you know, I went I went back into entertainment uh, full time, and haven't looked back. No, that's that's great, and and I think having a an accounting background, kind of in any industry, especially kind of in um, obviously entertainment and kind of technology, is is never a bad thing. If anything, I think it's like a huge bonus. 
Yeah, I think that, you know, I think education is important. I was fortunate uh, um, in the middle of my career, um, Alan Becker and the other executives at uh, Pace Management, which later rolled up into uh, to become part of Live Nation. Right, right. So I was the chief operating officer there, and um, I was able to uh, get my executive MBA at the University of Houston. Very cool. And that really changed my point of view um, in terms of understanding uh, other C-suite execs and and their disciplines and their points of view and and you know why. Uh, uh, marketing's important and why data is important and, you know, just really getting, uh, a, a deep dive into all of those, uh, different, um, uh, specialties and it, it gives you a broader, uh, perspective that, that was very formative in, uh, um, in when I, you know, went and formed my own company for which, uh, you know, then, then you really are the C-suite. You're the you're the CEO, and uh, you know the 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 targets on your back. And you're kind of leading the parade. So. Sure, sure. That's great. So walk me and the listener through kind of your entertainment career up until kind of Ruby Entertainment, because you've done a ton of stuff in there, and I really want to kind of cover that. But I really want to focus kind of on your your new venture, Ruby Entertainment, as well. So give us kind of a quick overview of your you know, career up until Ruby? Well, it really, it, like I say, it started in uh, high school and college sure. um, where I understood uh, or learned the craft, if you will, of marketing and promotion and mo- most importantly, selling tickets. Yeah. Whether, enough, right? you know, they were, they were dances uh, 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 that featured uh, live talent or, concerts that featured live talent. We had a classic film series, you know, um, and so all, all of those activities, um, really came down to selling tickets. And so, uh, that's something that I really understand. And, you know, I, I, uh, love, uh, connecting, um, uh, artists, uh, and content, you know, with fans and, and seeing, uh, how much people enjoy, you know, that type of entertainment together. Sure. So, um, I did that, uh, through, uh, the pace companies where I went to form my own company, um, which at that time, uh, uh was, was called, uh, spring, uh, communications and and the purpose of the company was to focus on uh, digital distribution for live events uh, where there was not an obvious network outlet okay. so at that point in time you know um, cable was uh, uh, addressable cable and pay-per-view uh, were just really coming online Sure. And I saw that as, a, as an opportunity for um, content to uh, monetize um, and take advantage of uh, cable advertising, which, um, you know, the cross-channel commercials were, uh, were very uh, uh, significant and uh, brought real value. So um, I specialized in concerts and in particular... Um, uh, began a, a nine-year relationship with the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. Um, and as part of that, uh, we created the brand Rodeo Houston, Very which cool. continues, you know, to this day. That's great. Um, but it was basic, yeah, it, you know, it was basically bringing uh, an audience to um, uh, to those shows. And, and what, what we found was, um, which probably won't surprise uh, you or your listeners, mm-hmm. and that is that, you know, uh, the closer you were to the event uh, physically in terms of geography, the better it sold. <laughs> so, you know, you, you were literally capitalizing on um, the, the heat of the local event, 
And so the more digital technology enabled the signal to be concentrated and uh, dedicated to specific areas, the more successful, uh, in essence, it became. And, you know, to me, that was one of the things that, um, that was really important to me, and that is that, that when you've got um, big events that, you know, are supported by big brands and big bands, that um, everybody wants to feel like it was successful. Sure. And part of the success is, in essence, you know, having people of like minds um, be aware of it, enjoy it together, and, um, in essence, share that action. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. That's really fascinating, actually. That's, that's really cool. So walk me through kind of why did you decide to kind of found Ruby Entertainment and what exactly is it? Uh, we're um, kind of an extension uh, or, or maybe the next chapter Okay. Um, when I started uh, Spring Communications, which evolved into um, uh, Spring Programming Partners when uh, U.S. Satellite Broadcasting um, joined as a partner okay. and then uh, morphed into uh, AEG Network Live, right. um, you know, which, which uh, uh, was part of my run at, uh, uh, at AEG. And um, I think that uh, the purpose was, you know, as I, as I said earlier, to offer uh, d distribution and monetization uh, of digital content for um, events, activities, um, documentaries and the like uh, that uh, don't have... Uh, you know, obvious distribution through a uh, through a network or a studio or uh, another uh, mainline distributor. Sure. Okay. Very cool. So, so what exactly do you guys kind of do at, at Ruby Entertainment? You've kind of covered it, but I, I really want to just have the listener fully understand kind of exactly what you guys kind of do because I think it's really cool. Basically, you know, you have an idea for an event. Okay. Or you have, uh, uh, and, and so, you know, if you have an idea for an event, um, my background and my experience, you know, as a producer, um, I can uh, help you create, uh, uh, one, the live event, two, the electronic uh, digital capture and distribution, the monetization strategy for that, um, possible... Uh, uh, partners uh, that could come to the party with other resources uh, to support it. And, you know, uh, that that uh, beyond live events, you know, you could, uh, you may have created a documentary or you've, uh, you, you've created, uh, um, you know, you've got a new album coming out and you, you want uh, a big event to support that. Sure. Um, you know, that's the type of thing uh, I did at AEG, you know, for years with artists like Bon Jovi and Prince and Katy sure. Perry and, you know, uh, festivals like uh, oh, British Summertime in Hyde Park and New Orleans okay. Jazz and Heritage Festival, first two years of Global Citizen Festival. Oh, wow. So. Yeah. No, that's great. So basically you've done events for people and companies and brands that basically everybody in the general public's kind of heard of and and that's really cool right because i think a lot of times you know that's kind of the the dream kind of clientele but i think you kind of mentioned it before when we were talking that you've always kind of you know embraced the cpa and kind of your management background but if you're really using kind of tech to basically bring your ideas and your kind of passion to to put in behind these kind of events and actually bring kind of Ruby Entertainment, you know, into kind of common everyday things nowadays, like online or recording kind of concerts or events and, and kind of broadcasting them. So walk me through kind of 
how you kind of work with these people to actually put pull some of this stuff off because I think it's it's really complicated or it can be is that fair to say uh you know it can be but but it it's like anything else you know in life um if you break it down into its component parts and okay. you organize them and you identify the resources that you need then uh you know surround yourself with the right people and enable them to uh to do what they need to do and get out of the way interesting you know? okay just, just be there you know when it uh um when you need it, and and you know you want you also in essence, uh, what, what do they say? Management by walking around. Um, so you, you know you you have to uh, you have to uh, uh, embrace and uh, enable, um, like I say, you know people to do uh, what they're there to do. Um, but by the same token, you have to. Uh, uh, embrace, particularly when you're doing live, you have to embrace the unknown. Sure. And that's kind of why you did all your preparation, whether, you know, when we did the Michael Jackson Memorial, you know, we were all over the world with that. I think, uh, Wikipedia said that the, um, the audience was in the billions. So, um, I think it was the largest TV broadcast, uh, at the time or something like that. Sure. But the point is that, um, you know, literally when, when you're uh, dealing with live satellite distribution, you know, you can have weather patterns across Europe that right. <laughs> can interfere. Sure. And so, you, you know, you, you could be, uh, in essence, moving from satellite to satellite to make sure that at the end of the day, you know, the end user, whether they're on a cell phone uh, um, in Asia and India, which uh, that's where we reach the uh, the majority of that audience, sure. or they were on the BBC in uh, the UK. Right, right. So how do you kind of get everything in place? Because like, like, let's go with the Michael Jackson Memorial. Like, you're having billions of people watch this thing. How do you plan kind of the hardware, software, and side of that thing and to make sure that you keep the feed kind of up and you know people can actually watch it like you mentioned move satellites but is there anything else that you can do to kind of make sure that it you know actually stays live because you got to be just bombarded with traffic from kind of satellite online and kind of everything around that well but it's like i say it's it's the biggest part of that is you know um, bringing in the right team because no okay. one individual can do all of it. Sure. You know, okay. I, I guess usually my title on a on a on an event like that would be, you know, I'd be the executive producer okay. um, in charge of distribution. Um, and then you know Ken Ehrlich and uh, um, Kenny Ortega were actually producing it. So okay. they were the ones that, uh, you know, that were responsible for the cameras and, you know, what was in the feed. All I did was take the feed and make sure that it was on screens worldwide, every, and, you know, every screen from a mobile phone uh, to movie theaters. Sure. The only caveat was that you couldn't charge. You couldn't oh, okay. charge to watch it. So if you were going to a movie theater... The movie theater had to open for free, okay. and you know we caught some uh, uh, some folks that were reselling the signal um, in Europe, and so we shut them down. Um, so you know the, those are the kind of complications, and and literally we were we were dealing with transcoding for mobile. Sure. The night before the event. Okay. You know, because all that kind of stuff was brand new. They, you know, you didn't have uh, Twitter and Amazon. <laughs> you know? Sure, sure, yeah, um, yeah. You know, live streaming the NFL um, at that point in time. So, but I, I, again, it's 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 uh, you're you're embracing uh, the possibilities as opposed to having the potential risks. Oh, it could go down. Well, yeah, it could, but you know, you have to, 
you, in essence, have to trust the process that um, that it, that you know if you do if you do the right work and bring the right people uh, to the right idea, it's going to work and it's going to be great. Sure. Well, and you've also done this. Uh, for a long time too, right? So you have probably a really Correct. good network of people you trust. There's been things that have right. worked and not worked in the past. And and it sounds like just kind of when we were talking a bit before that you guys really stay up on kind of current technology, right? Because you kind of have to. Like if you're streaming to the latest mobile device or like when the mobile device first came out, you were, you know, like you mentioned, kind of worrying about transcoding for that device the night before. Like you guys very much have to kind of stay current with the latest kind of hardware. Is, is that's fair to say? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And and you know, I think that that in doing that, it it opens up more possibilities in terms of you know the latest technology is usually smaller, faster, and cheaper. Sure. Um, right. Maybe not on the front end uh, in terms of uh, reduced costs, but. But in the long run, it becomes uh, uh, less expensive, and that enables you to add more value to the experience of, uh, of the viewer. So everybody wins in that instance. But but again, you have to embrace the possibilities and you know plan for uh, potential problems. Sure. So have you guys, or are you guys ever planning on doing anything in the, the VR or kind of AI space? Yeah, I think that uh, I, I think that in particular, it, it offers a really special experience between uh, the viewer and the content. It's a much more personal experience. In other words, you know, uh, uh, most of what I do um, is is targeting um, entertainment and content that can be experienced in a group, and you feel the energy of everyone else who's part of that group. Um, whereas VR and uh, AI, you know, in, in, to a large extent, it's it's a very personal uh, experience, but it, it 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 immerses you substantially, uh, you know, to literally uh, the content uh, consumes you and becomes your world. So, you know, I think that that at the end of the day, what you want to do is you want to embrace these things and, um, and, and these technologies and, uh, and this uh, new kind of content, because at the end of the day, we serve, you know, uh, in essence, the content audience. We don't tell them um, what they should or shouldn't like. We serve what they tell us they do or don't want. Interesting. Okay. That, so how do you kind of, decide that though is there do you guys kind of pull that do you kind of watch trends how do you kind of keep up with on where your content should be like obviously probably traditional online but is there anything else that you you guys are kind of watching or monitoring to see where you should make sure this happens because like for example i guess like do you still really put out like dvd content like i know you've done some projects but like the sales of DVDs have got to be down compared to just like people rather pay a, pay some money, start watching it online, or, or maybe it's free. Is that fair to say? Like, how do you kind of watch those trends and decide where you need to be or not be? Well, I, th I think that, you know, streaming is um, probably the media, the medium of choice. Okay. Uh, for what used to be uh, DVDs, because... You know, it's easier to find it. Sure. <laughs> How many sure. times yeah. have, have you wanted to uh, watch Tommy Boy again, and you sure. know you bought it? <laughs> <laughs> you you sure. probably have it on a VHS and a DVD, and maybe even a Blu-ray. Sure. But when you want to when you want to see it, you can't find it. But you know, boom! It's it's on Netflix or it's on Amazon or Hulu. You, you know, it's somewhere uh, that that's immediately accessible. However, you know, I think that, that in particular um, content that speaks to people, you know, uh, people like to share that. And, you know, I think it's much more personal to share it on a disc, in essence, a, di a physical disc that you can hand to your friend and say, here, I really want you to enjoy this or I want you to experience this sure. or I want to share the message of this with you. Uh, it's It's... 
deeper than a link. I, I give you an example uh, of something that that's like that, um, sure. and that is uh, the handwritten note. Yeah, a handwritten thank you note. I mean, people just don't do it as much. However, the impact of a handwritten thank you note is so much uh, more substantial than a, a thank you email. Nothing wrong with a thank you email. Sure. But, you know, that handwritten note is really special. Yeah. No, I... That makes sense? No, that totally makes sense. You're, you're right. Like, because... I remember growing up, um, you know, and you go into like the record store or something and you'd spend like hours sometimes trying to decide what record to buy. And then you, you know, you'd crack open the CD, the the rap and you'd put it in. And even if you didn't even really like the record, you'd play it a bunch of times. Right. And then right. sometimes you would, you'd end up really liking it. Sometimes maybe you only liked a few songs or whatnot. But like nowadays with streaming, a new record comes out by like your favorite artist. And if you're not even in the mood, you could be like, nah, I don't really like it. And then you never go back to that record or maybe you do. And then you're like, wow, I don't know why I hated this so much like six months ago. Right. Because it's just... Sometimes like right. everything's just at your fingertips and it's it's almost like I can listen to anything but I don't know what I feel like listening or watching because I find that sometimes with Netflix or you know just on demand music streaming services like you're like I have access to everything but I can't pick something. And and that's kind of the same in the same kind of vein, right? Where you appreciate when somebody actually spends a little bit extra time to write something where, you know, instead of just firing off a quick email from their phone Right, and 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 like you say, you you know you may uh, discover, you know, um, that new material by the artist through a streaming service, and you know you grow to love the entire album, you know, the body of work, and a lot of the audience now is by you know is is actually buying it uh, on vinyl. Sure, very much so. Yeah, you know, vinyl is is really back. Sure, and it's not it, it, you know it's not uh, uh, price sensitive, if you will. As a matter of fact, I think that people have a stronger connection with that content because they paid more money. It's more important to them. Sure. Now that's a that's an interesting way of putting it. You're, for sure, I like, and I it could just be me. I'm 34, just so you have some context. But like, I still think like listening to music on a on like vinyl sounds the best. I know it's not the best quality oh, yeah. audio, but like I think that still sounds the absolute best to me. And it doesn't have to even be on like a really expensive record player. In some ways it almost sounds better if it's just on like a, you know, regular plain Jane record player. Like I really enjoy that. And and it sounds like you're kind of in the same boat. Is that fair to say? Yeah, there's a there, there's a warmth Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in essence you know um to the sound that that and, and and that warmth makes it feel like it's yours sure um but by the same token you know if you're if you're going to be on a flight and and you know for five hours and and you want music you know you're you're either going to stream it or you're going to play it out of your own digital library sure and that's you know, if it's your digital library, then it's probably a whole bunch of uh, different songs that you've downloaded individually um, that now become, in essence, part of a different collection. But that's a different experience than, you know, sitting down and listening to, uh, you know, a vinyl. Because in a lot of cases, uh, uh, that, uh, in essence, album, if you will, tells a story. Sure. You know, there's a band, um, the Moody Blues. They're going yeah. into uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame sure. uh, this next April, I think. Well, that's, that's great. And in particular, yeah, they were famous for, um, I think they did seven or eight albums. Sure. And they all had themes. Yeah, Beatles yeah. were another one. You know, sure. in particular, yep. if you look at the second Really, when they came back from uh, the ashram in India, yeah, and you know, I, I think their um, their albums from that point on, they all had a theme. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's interesting. Sure, that's 
I never really thought about all their albums having theme, but you're right. They totally do. Like, I, I actually saw them a few years ago with my dad, and it was a great show. So that, that's great. Um, so I, I kind of want to tie it back into kind of Ruby Entertainment and kind of what you guys are doing, because I think you're kind of making content on I, – I, not really the, the device and the screen size not really matter anymore, and it really seems like you guys have kind of embraced that in technology because, like, you guys have done stuff – streaming to YouTube and to DVD or kind of live on demand. Um, how, where do you think kind of the industry's kind of going? I like, it seems like it's maybe a little bit stagnant in the sense of like, it's a little bit uncomfortable with like traditional cables kind of people are cord cutting, people are moving to, you know, Netflix or Hulu and YouTube or Google launch YouTube TV this year. Like, is, do you kind of see where some of this stuff is going or is it still kind of hard to say and we're kind of in this, like, we're see where things are going to kind of shake out? Well, again, I think that that the key is where do you, as the, as the viewer or the fan, where do you want to experience content? Okay. And in particular, you know, millennials are all about experiences. Sure. You know, and, and I think that, you know, part of what uh, I'm doing at Ruby Entertainment is talking to content creators about how do they eventize, you know, even a network uh, uh, series, if you will, mm-hmm. you know, th- for the season launch or the, uh, or the season conclusion. How do you bring all the fans uh, together? You know, it's been done like... Um, Walking Dead did uh, uh, did an event that sold out at Madison Square Garden, but you know which which was extraordinary. You know, particularly sure. if you lived in New York. Sure. However, if you didn't live in New York, yeah, you know, fair. It, it really didn't touch you. So how how in essence do you uh, do you touch people? Um, you know, um, across uh, across the country and around the world. Sure. And again, it's it's a the screen, you know, whether it's a movie screen or you know, uh, um, stream uh, streaming media, whether it's you know on on your flat screen at home or your computer screen or your uh, or your mobile phone, you know, um, you want to make sure that you um, let the viewer make that choice. You don't you, you don't want to demand because I think in particular, um, if you look at the audience under oh somewhere forty or fifty, yeah. they don't want to be told what to do. Sure, you know you, you you tell that audience what to do and they will not go in the other direction. Sure. However, if if you make uh, you know if you make it make them feel like it's their choice uh, to experience then that audience in particular is uh, demands to be part of the event and part of the uh, conversation. So whereas, you know, 40 plus, they, they are less inclined uh, to worry about, you know, what even the guy next door is doing. But I, I think that in particular, um, you need to be aware of what people want. What, what did they say? Um, uh, you know, what's the secret to success? Find a need and fill it. Well, sure. that means that somebody needs something, right? And you're yeah. not you're not here to tell them what that is. Interesting. No, I, I think that's that's really good advice. So for, for people that are maybe looking to kind of get into the entertainment business, not necessarily being necessarily in front of the camera, but from kind of, you know, is basically you've done this a bunch of times where you started a company you or you've created a company, you've sold companies or parts of companies, you've kind of done some merger stuff, you've done obviously some huge events for some big brands that everybody's heard of. What advice do you kind of give to young people that kind of want to get into the entertainment space? Because I think it's one of the hardest spaces to break into. Do you agree with that? Well, it, yeah, it, 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 it is because... You know, there there are people that want to do it for free, sure. Um, whether they're qualified or not, when you go into the entertainment business, the first thing you want to be aware of is the difference between 
the uh, what people call the entertainment business and the business of entertainment. Okay. What's and it's a key distinction. Be- well, you're there to make money. Sure. Okay. You know, at the end of the day, you know, and, and, and there are a number of people that uh, invest um, almost as, as a, you know, as, uh, as a habit or, um, you know, I'll throw a million or two million dollars against this and see if it sticks. Uh, at the end of the day, you, in order to succeed in entertainment, I think what you, what you have to do is you have to identify something that you feel so strongly about that you do it for free and you do it so well that people pay you insane amounts of money to do it. Gotcha. That's really, you know, kind of the, the highest and best use. And if you've got a good idea, you know, there are people that, that will help you uh, get your idea to market. But you also have to be open to the fact that maybe the idea that you have isn't that great. Sure, and pivot your idea potentially? Oh, yeah. Look, entertainment is all about the pivot. Okay, interesting. No, I, yeah, that's, I, I guess. So how did you know when you kind of founded Ruby Entertainment, like how did you know that this is where there was a lack and need in the market? Like, was it through your experience? Did you have a bunch of people kind of reach out to you? Or, or how did you kind of decide, like, you know what, I really need to kind of focus on, on this kind of space inside of entertainment and actually do this? Well, I know, I know that there's a market because I follow okay. markets in terms of who's buying what and, okay. um, you know, who's watching what and, and who likes what and what do they like about it and what don't they like about it and how can I, um, you know, bring something to the party that makes it better. Uh, to to try an idea and and willing to you know say at the end of the day if it didn't work hey it didn't work so we're going to pivot and we're going to do it this way uh, the next time so it will work sure no I, I I think that's really good advice so I'm curious though how how do you kind of decide potentially um, who to work for because you probably can pick at this point kind of clients and, and things to cover. Is sometimes it a little bit passion project? Is it sometimes, you know, people come to you and just say like, yeah, that's technically challenging. Or do you kind of just say, you know what, like if, if your event's cool and you have kind of the, the willingness and the budget to do this, we'll make it happen for you. Yeah. I, th- I think it's, it's all of the above, but okay. I, I would say the other thing I know, um, that you always have to be aware of, of what the, uh, of what your timeline looks like, Okay. you know, particularly in terms of, first off, the only thing you can't get more of in life is time. Sure. You can get more money. You can get more, you know, really cool projects. You can get more great people to work with and everything, but you can't get more time. Sure. So you have to be, you know, careful about how you allocate your time and you have to put it against projects that actually will occur. So you don't end up with, you know, six months and nothing going on. Sure. So how do you, unless that's what you choose to do, I guess. Sure. But how do you kind of judge which projects are kind of worth your time? Is there advice you could give people around that? Well, I, I could give you, um, yeah, a, a couple of different perspectives on that. One, you know, I, I, I uh, go with what I believe in. Okay. And um, so I kind of stick with um, values-oriented things. I, I, I really don't... Uh, get involved in anything that's, you know, much above PG okay, uh, unless there's a, there, um, unless there, well, because, you know, typically the, uh, uh, that's what's going to appeal to a mainstream audience and therefore mainstream media. 
right. is not going to have an issue, you know, marketing it and, and also brands, sure. you know, um, that make great marketing partners. Now that's, that's not to say that there aren't, you know, uh, ours that, um, uh, and, and, you know, I have been involved, uh, with some of them, but, but to me that, uh, there's more caution involved sure. there. And then, you know, the other side of it is data, you know, okay. what does the data tell you in terms of what's the audience's interest in this topic or this type of content and what, um, so, so when you know that data, what does that suggest? What's the trend? You know, because usually you're looking at it three to six months before um, you're 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 planning on bringing it to market. Um, so, or you know, even a year, you know, sure. until you bring it to market. So, what's the, you know, what's the audience's appetite for this going to be at that time? Yeah, that's actually really good advice, right? Because if you're a year out from something, you're yeah, you're right. If that artist is going to be relevant, maybe, maybe not. They they probably will be. Or like when you guys did the Michael Jackson thing, you probably didn't have a lot of time to repair, right? So there's probably a ton of, you know, depend, like factors that play into, yeah, I never really thought of it like that. And and then to your point a second ago, like if you're not, if you're not going to be passionate about a project that's going to happen in a year, you might just say, well, we're not going to take this one on. And I, But I... But I think that's good advice to kind of young people coming up, right? Because sometimes people chase the money and don't really care. Sometimes they rather chase the project or a bit of both. But to your point, if you're not passionate about it, I, I think it, it doesn't really matter because eventually you'll kind of lose interest if you're not really passionate about it. Right. And, and you're, you know, you're, you're not going to uh, deliver the results that you're really capable of doing. Sure. It's not, you know, um, I, I think that you really need to believe um, in in what you're doing because it becomes part of you and it should be reflective sure. of you and who you are and, 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 you know, and who you're, uh, you know, who you hang, what was the thing that all of our moms used to say to us, uh, <laughs> tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you what you're, who you are, you know. Um, sure. So, and, and, and I think the other thing, uh, the other point that you made is, is spot on and that is don't run the meter. Okay. You know, uh, I mean, in, in particular, you know, uh, we all do things because, you know, we, we got families to feed and, and, and people are depending on us. But you can't do that for a lifetime. Interesting. That's so nice. you know, in 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 particular, you know, you you want to you you want to find something that you feel so strongly about that you know you do it for free, and then do it so well that they pay you really well to do it. That's you know that's kind of the holy grail of uh, I think any kind of work you know, entertainment or not, but, uh, it's, it's definitely worked for me in, enter, in entertainment. No, John, I, I think that's actually really, really good advice. And we're coming to the end of the show, but I really want to kind of talk about your involvement with the media excellence awards. You're, you're a board member kind of, what was the reason you kind of decided to get involved on that? I know you've known Sarah for a number of years, but what made you kind of decide to be on the board of that? Well, I, I, I really believe in, in what uh, the MEA stand for, and that is, uh, you know, excellence in technology and, and re rewarding companies for creating, uh, you know, new software and new uh, hardware that, uh, um, that fills a need and, um, uh, you know, makes people's lives more enjoyable. Sure. And so I think nobody was really doing it in the mobile space. And so I think that, uh, I think, I, I think, yeah, I've been working with Sarah now, I, I guess since, uh, probably somewhere in the two thousands, uh, maybe 2005, six, seven, something like that. That's great. Um, 
but I, I really believe in, uh, in in Sarah and Allison and their whole team. Um, and I, I think the MEAs are uh, what this is the 10th anniversary, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's it's really uh, you know I'm honored to uh, uh, to stand alongside uh, uh, the other board members uh, in support of uh, Sarah and her vision and uh, you know all that uh, all the the MEAs. Uh, bring to our industry oh that's great man and i i'm actually going to be there and i look forward to kind of meeting you in person in on january 18th and uh what sadly john we're we're at the end of the show so let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself and ruby entertainment so you can find me on linkedin okay john ruby r-u-b-e-y uh, you can find me uh, online at uh, rubyentertainment.com. So again, that's R-U-B-E-Y entertainment.com. Um, and you can find me at the MEAs in January. Perfect, John. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and have a good rest of your day. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Talk Thanks, to you man. soon. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit the show's website at buildingthefutureshow.com. Also check us out on Facebook at Building the Future Show and follow us on Twitter at Building Show. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.